all about the brightest minds in the world of finance and macroeconomics telling it like it is. Bullish or bearish, no holds barred. Now, here are your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. Macro Voices episode 49 was recorded on February 9th, 2017, as Macro Voices turns one year old. I'm Eric Townsend. One year ago this week, we launched this podcast with macro investing legend Jim Rogers as our featured interview guest. And to this day, that episode remains our most popular ever. You can't top Jim Rogers, but we can bring him back for our anniversary show. So Jim and I will be discussing everything from China to Donald Trump to the U.S. dollar rally to the question of whether or not the secular bond bull market is really over or not to the question of whether or not economic conditions and government policies elevate the risk of war. All of that and much more is coming up in this week's featured interview. And I'm Patrick Ceresna. Eric that S&P 500 finally broke out above 2300. Is this rally for real? Well, it's going to be really interesting to find out, that's for sure. Uh, I've been saying to myself all week, boy, it looks like we're trying to work off round number resistance at 2300. And my intention for this show was to predict that we would break out above 2300. Of course, the market beat me to it. So here we are. I wouldn't be surprised if we retreat back below 2300 just for a day or two. As uh, some people are going to hear that we got to 2300, they think that's going to be the top. They're going to sell. And I wouldn't be surprised if it just works its way higher. Now, just to be clear, on a fundamental level, I still think that this market is way overvalued. But on a technical level, you know, breakouts above round number resistance oftentimes have legs. And I think that we're seeing the beginning of that. I wouldn't be surprised if it moves considerably higher. Uh, as for my own trading, I'm taking myself out of this game. And, and you know, I, I probably sound like I don't have a lot of value to add to listeners on this equity market because what I've been saying for several weeks here is I, I have no clue. If I can offer anything in terms of an insight about trading that might be of value, you have to really remember as a trader that if I kind of draw an analogy to uh, a sports game like football. The player's job is to be the best player they can, but the coach also has an important job, which is if the coach sees a player who's just not performing, they broke up with their girlfriend, they're, they're not on their game or whatever, they take them out of the game. And as a trader, you are the player, but you're also the coach. And, you know, I think that this market is ridiculously overvalued. And you know what else? I've been wrong about that call a whole bunch of times in a row. So I'm taking myself out of this game. I, I'm not going to try to trade my fundamental view, which would be to go short here, but I'm also not going to go long because I don't believe in the market. If I had to predict anything, it would be a return to volatility. One direction or the other, this business is just hovering just barely below 2300 and not really moving one way or another. I think we've had something, uh, maybe a record number of sessions with less than a 1% intraday move. That's going to change. One way or the other, I think we're going to see a, a big move here. I, I just don't know which way. Now I want to move on to that U.S. dollar. That U.S. dollar index continuously is holding that 100 handle and is again trying to break out. Is this going to happen? Well, I think it will. I mean, uh, and I'm not worried about it. Look at what's going on here. We're seeing a rally in equities. Normally, there would be an inverse correlation there. You would expect some dollar weakness. You're seeing gold performing very well this week. That would normally pretend some dollar weakness. But the dollar is at the high end of its recent trading range, and it looks like it's about to break out even higher still. So as we've discussed in the last few shows, I think what we saw here was that when Donald Trump despite his actions and his actual policies being extremely dollar bullish, when he made some dollar bearish uh, rhetoric, it uh, caused the market to sell off to its technical support level, which was just above 99. I had already doubled down on my long position on the way down through 101. Uh, I did consider doing that below 99.50. I, I, at this point, of course, I wish I had. At the time, I was kind of fearing just because of the size of the positions, how crowded this trade is. I thought that if it got hammered below 99, maybe that could start an avalanche. But I thought the more likely case was exactly what we're seeing, which is that it would bounce off of technical support and start to move higher. That's exactly what's happened. So I'm not concerned. And again, the, the key here is to understand that while the talk is still dollar bearish, the policies are still dollar bullish. 
All right. Now, what I wanted to really ask you, Eric, is what's going on here with crude oil? That there was that big inventory build, that crude oil drops down to $51 like a hammer and then reverses and then is now trading around this 53 level. Where is it going next here? Boy, the market sure is in love with this magic number of 53. I don't know what the heck is going on there. Just uh, to fill our listeners who don't follow this closely in on what's happened, it's been a real roller coaster week. API first came out on Tuesday afternoon saying big build in inventory. People, A lot of people were skeptical that it could be real. It was confirmed by DOE, a 13.8 million barrel build on national inventory. That's the second largest build in record recorded history. At the same time, Cushing, Oklahoma, 1.1 million barrel build on inventory. So you see these huge and unexpected, that 13.8 million barrel national build, that was uh, on the back of about a 1 million to 1.2 million barrel consensus expectation. At the same time, the Gulf Coast saw a all-time record 10 million barrels in a single week on the Gulf Coast alone in Pad 3. That's building to an all-time high in Pad 3 inventories. The the talk on the street is that it's a last-ditch effort by OPEC countries to export as much as they could before the cut became effective. Honestly, that sounds to me like people are making up stories to explain something that uh, they don't like. Gasoline did see a relatively small drawdown, but a drawdown just the same of 869,000 barrels. Now, keep in mind, we were seeing 6 million barrel a week builds in gasoline inventories for three or four weeks in a row. So less than a million barrels drawdown does not strike me as a big deal. That's really the only thing that seems to be maybe sort of kind of bullish in this story at all. Distillates were a 29, you know, de minimis 29,000 barrel build on inventories. So the only drawdown here is gasoline, and it's on the back of weeks and weeks of massive gasoline builds. I, I don't know where the bullish news is, but if you look at the tape action, what's happened? And incidentally, we also have production up. The rig count is up. I mean, it's all hugely bearish fundamental factors. What does the price do? It gets hammered down on the actual inventory report. But 20 minutes later, the rally starts, and it just keeps on going. And we're all the way back up to 53 bucks after almost testing 51 even. I think the low print on WTI was around 51.20 or so. And we're back up above 53 as we're speaking on Thursday afternoon. It's easy to say, well, okay, the uh, explanation for that is that with Iran and the threat of more sanctions and the potential for Donald Trump to be, you know, threatening ISIS, whatever, these are all geopolitical risk factors. Yeah, but the thing is, it's, you know, right on the back of the inventory numbers, which were hugely bearish. That's where the rally started. So it doesn't really make sense to me at all, but that's what we're seeing in this crazy market. All right, let's move on to gold. Gold was actually having a pretty good week, continuously crawling up to that uh, 1,240 handle. And then uh, just as the U.S. dollar broke out, we see uh, gold coming off the highs. Where do you think gold is going next? Well, I said a while back, several weeks ago, that it was going to be interesting to see whether 1225 or 1125 came first. And honestly, I was expecting another test of 1125 to come first. And we've got our answer, and I was proven wrong. We're up to 1240 here. Is this really a breakout that's got legs? Uh, Stan Druckenmiller, who had sold all of his gold on election night, very publicly talked about that, says that he's getting back into gold. A lot of the gold bugs have really hyped that up. Oh, Druckenmiller is, is bullish. Well, if you listen to his comments, he's not radically bullish. What he said is that he wanted to get some currency exposure. He, he was trying to decide what to buy and figured that gold actually made a little bit of sense here, considering that it had been hammered down. He, he wasn't saying this is, you know, the buying opportunity of a lifetime. It sounded like it was kind of like, yeah, okay, I'll buy some. So I'm still on the sidelines. I, I am extremely bullish gold in the long term, but I think that this dollar rally is likely to accelerate from here. When it does, it's going to produce a headwind for gold. Does that mean we're going to get to new lows below a thousand or something? I don't know. But do I think that we're headed to 1500 next? Not in the face of the dollar rally that I think 
think is coming. So I'm going to continue to play the long dollar position. Uh, I'm going to look to hedge that with a long gold position at some point. But I'm trying to leg in starting with the dollar long, and I'll save the gold long until I think the dollar has gotten a little bit closer to its next major resistance level. And I don't think we're there yet. Eric, those 10-year Treasury bonds are now below the 240 level on the yield. Where do you think it's going next? Yeah, we're looking at two spot 38 as we tape the show just after 4 o'clock on Thursday afternoon. Some people think this is a short squeeze that we're seeing here. Uh, a lot of people who had taken the words of Bill Gross or Jeff Gundlach, I would say out of context, because what those guys said is when you see the move past 260 or 3, that's where you know the bear market is in play. I think that people were putting shorts on. Maybe they're getting squeezed out of that position. Lower gasoline demand, although, of course, with this week's oil inventory number, maybe we're not seeing lower gasoline demand after all, but it's been looking for the last few weeks like there's been lower gasoline demand. That could be signaling an oncoming recession. That could be helping. And I think it's a wait and see trade. For me, the trade I care about is not being long treasuries. It's being short treasuries. And I don't think it's time yet. Bill Gross and Jeff Gunluck make excellent points, but Raul Paul also made excellent points. I'm not sure yet who's right. When we get to the next recession, the one that maybe pulls us even below 1% in the 10-year Treasury, I think that's going to be a secular turning point where you want to be short strategically Treasuries, expecting a major return to higher interest rates. This idea that it's already begun, that the secular bear market and bonds is already upon us, maybe, could be, but I'm not persuaded of it yet. Thanks for the market update, Eric. Quantum Fund co-founder and legendary macro investor Jim Rogers is back as this week's featured interview guest. Please stay tuned after the interview as Eric and I will be back to talk about how options trading strategies can be applied to some of the views Eric expressed in today's market wrap. Eric's interview with Jim Rogers is coming up as Macro Voices continues right here at MacroVoices.com. And now with this week's special guest, here's hedge fund manager, Eric Townsend. Joining me next is a man who needs no introduction, investing legend, Jim Rogers. Jim, when you appeared on this program one year ago, Macro Voices was brand new. We had no name, no reputation, and no following. Yet despite having no regular audience following at that time, that one interview remains our most popular show ever with more than half again as many listener downloads as our next most popular interview with fund manager Hugh Hendry much more recently. So congratulations on your top billing status, and I have no doubt that you'll set a new record today. Well, Eric, I think I should hang up now. I should hang <laughs> up while I'm ahead. Are you kidding? <laughs> with a record uh, like that, an introduction like that, I want to stop while I'm, while I'm ahead. Well, before we let you go, let's start with equity markets then, because when we spoke a year ago, you and I were both very concerned about markets being overvalued. You went out of your way to say that you didn't know whether it would happen in 2016 or 2017 or 2018, but you felt that significant downside was ahead for the markets eventually. And if I look back just six months ago, a lot of industry luminaries, whether we think about guys like Ray Dalio, Stan Druckenmiller, Carl Icahn, these guys were all casting bearish views for a lot of the same reasons that you and I were. Then Donald Trump was elected president, and suddenly all of these guys turned super bullish. Ray Dalio seems to be backing away from that enthusiasm in the last week or two. But the fact remains that some super talented people all turned bullish super bullish after the election. Forgive me, Jim, I'm just not seeing the logic to this, are you? Well, yes and no. Mr. Trump has said he's going to do some wonderful things. He's going to cut taxes, which is always great for any society, any country. He said he's going to rebuild the infrastructure, which America desperately needs and is good for America. He says he's going to bring home the three trillion dollars, US dollars, which American companies have overseas. All of these things are wonderful, wonderful things. And if he can do it, Eric, wow, things are going to be great. But Mr. Trump has also said he's going to have trade war with China, Mexico, Japan, Korea, a few other people that he 
has named, he swore that on his first day in office, he would impose 45 percent tariffs against China. Well, he's been there three weeks, two or three weeks, and he hasn't done it yet, but uh, he's still got it in his head, I'm sure. Uh, maybe he's just another politician like all the rest of them. He says one thing and doesn't mean it at all, but he does have at least three people in high levels in his uh, group who are very, very keen to have trade wars with China and other people. If he does that, Eric, it's all over. I mean, history is very clear that trade wars always lead to problems, often to disaster, sometimes even to real war, shooting war. So uh, I don't know. I'm not sure Mr. Trump knows. He said so many things, and many of the things are contradictory. Now, if he's not going to have trade wars with various people, then chances are for a while, happy days are here. When we spoke last year, you anticipated even more strength for the U.S. dollar. And as is usually the case, the market has proven you right. But you were careful to say that it's not because the true fundamentals were bullish, but rather you went out of your way to emphasize that people would continue to buy dollars because they didn't know what else to do. And you thought that it could even turn into a bubble. So how have your views evolved a year later? Do you still think the dollar has much higher to go? And if so, how much higher from here? Well, I still own the dollar. The dollar, fortunately, is having a, a, a correction now. You know, all bull markets need corrections. Corrections are good. Uh, I haven't sold any. I may have even bought more, for all I know. No, I still see the same thing, that whatever happens in the world, there is going to be some turmoil somewhere along the line. We're already seeing it in some places. The euro is still having its own version of turmoil. It's going to have a lot more this year. So the dollar is going to be quote, a safe haven. As we discussed last year, Eric, it is not a safe haven, but it is perceived as a safe haven. And, and in fact, for some countries, it is a safe haven compared to, say, the euro or other, other currencies. So I still own the dollar. The fundamentals have only gotten worse, but the fundamentals have gotten everywhere, have gotten worse everywhere, uh, except maybe Russia. So I still own the U.S. dollar. Some people have suggested that the strength in the U.S. dollar could cause so many problems for emerging markets that we might eventually see something, let's call it like a Plaza Accord version 2.0, where governments around the world conspire to intentionally weaken the dollar to prevent or contain those adverse effects. Do you think that that's a possibility? Do you see that coming? And is that just something far out on the horizon or something that could happen soon? How, how do you see that? Uh, I've been around long enough to know that anything uh, is possible, no matter how weird it may sound. In fact, the weirder it sounds, the more likely it's probably going to happen. Uh, I, I doubt if it's going to be a plaza accord this time around. It's more likely this that the dollar is going to go higher and higher on its own volition for some of the reasons we discussed. It will get too high. So it, will, it will cause serious credit problems for some people because I've got a lot of people that borrowed a lot of dollars. It will also make many American companies less competitive. So the, it's going to go too high, may turn into a bubble, at which point I, I hope I'm smart enough to sell it because at some point market forces are going to cause the dollar to come back down because people are going to realize, oh, my gosh, this is causing a lot of turmoil, economic problems in the world, and it's damaging the American economy. At that point, the smart guys will get out. I hope I'm one of them. You said last year that you were long dollars and could easily see a bubble forming. But you went on to say that you could not imagine still owning dollars in 10 years' time. So now we're down to nine years. Do you still see that, that this has to come to an end? Do you see any signposts or any, anything on the horizon that would tell us? You, you mentioned just a moment ago that you hope you're one of the guys who's smart enough to get out in time. What signals would you be looking for to tell you when the time is that the dollar rally has played out and you know, the blow-off top is in or whatever it may be, and it's time to get on the other side of the trade? Well, if it turns into a bubble, all bubbles look the same. Uh, no matter what country, what period of history, what, what assets, you know, everybody's screaming to buy it. They're screaming that it's different this time. You don't understand. You old man, you just don't, cannot understand why everybody needs to un, under own dollars. So the signs will always be there. Uh, signs along the way will be some of the things I mentioned. You will start seeing 
bankruptcies by companies or countries that are extended, overextended in U.S. dollars. And since the dollar is going higher, they cannot repay their debts. You will see American companies and American balance of trade getting worse because of the high dollar. The signs will be pretty clear. They're pretty simple signs. They've been around for hundreds of years, thousands of years. I just hope I'm smart enough to recognize them and have the insight to interpret them properly. We also spoke last year about the 35-year bond bull market. You emphasized that you didn't know for sure how long it could go on, but you said that it was certain to end sooner or later. In the year since we've spoke, quite a few industry luminaries have come out and declared that the 35-year secular bull market in bonds is over. Jeff Gundlach made that call to his credit almost on the very day that remains so far, at least, the bottom in yields and the top in price. Bill Gross has said that if we saw a 10-year Treasury move over 2.6% in yield, that would be the signal in his mind that says a secular bear market is underway. Ray Dalio has said that the credit cycle is played out. What you said last year was that you were short junk bonds, but you thought at that point a year ago it was too early to make a short call on treasuries. What's your take now? Is it time to go short U.S. treasuries or is it still wait and see? Well, all those guys are smarter than I am, so I, I, I don't know. I, anyway, am not short bonds at the moment. Certainly would have been a good trade last summer, uh, as you pointed out. They, the bonds made a, uh, a high, or interest rates made a low, long-term rates made a low. Uh, they have rallied since, but for my money, right now, as we speak, here in February of 2017, everybody is bullish on long-term U.S. government bonds. I've been around long enough, Eric, to know that when everybody is on the same side of the boat, I better run to the other side. So I am not shorting government bonds. I am short junk bonds still. If and when the mood changes and people are less skeptical, if bonds go down and everybody starts saying, oh, bonds cheated me, she lied to me, they lied, then I might be ready to short bonds again. Because we're certainly in the process of making a top. When that top comes, I don't know. I'm smart. I'm a very, very, very bad market timer, as you know. I'm a very, very bad short-term trader. So you should ask those other guys to get your timing. Let's come back to the junk bonds. You and I were both short junk last we spoke a year ago. I'm still holding that position today. It sounds like you are too. And it was quite profitable, actually, for a few months after we spoke. But since then, we've given back some profits. Is there room to think that maybe we stayed in the trade too long, or is this just a pullback? It, it's hard for me. You know, obviously, the recovery in energy prices has helped junk bonds, but I, I can't believe this is over yet. How do you see it? Well, I happen to agree with you 100%. Uh, the very fact that I'm still short junk bonds, it means it's definitely you know, the timing is, is wrong. I uh, know int when interest rates start going up again permanently, when the, when the bull market really does come to an end in the interest rates, government bonds, interest rates are going to go very, very high, Eric, very high. If I told you how high, you would probably hang up now and not listen to me anymore. But – you know, in 1981, interest rates, short-term interest rates in America were over 20 percent. Bonds were yielding over – long-term bonds were yielding over 15 percent. We've had these long, long bull and bear markets in bonds in the United States, and we probably will again. So when interest rates go higher, the junk bonds are going to get destroyed both by interest rates and by credit defaults because many of them are, in fact, junk. <laughs> you know, the companies – are not great credit risk, and they're gonna they're gonna pay the price. I, I want to come back to that that whole point of interest rates going much higher. I couldn't agree more with you in terms of fundamentals that they should move higher. But I, I can't help but say, hey, wait a minute. In 1981, the U.S. was nowhere close to 20 trillion dollars of national debt, and now that we are. It seems to me, if you were to go back to historically normal interest rates, even a 6% 10-year yield, never mind 
uh, how, how could that happen without bankrupting the government because it can't service its debt? And what I'm trying to get my head around is if it can't happen, d- does that mean that the interest rates can't go higher or does it mean they do go higher and the government can't service its debt and it leads to a major fiscal crisis? Do you think that when we get to the point where the natural market forces want to push interest rates higher, that governments will somehow contain them in order to keep their debts serviceable? Or do you think it means that governments are headed towards defaults and bankruptcy when we get to the point where interest rates return to their historical norms? I'm sorry, why do you think governments cannot go bankrupt? It's happened throughout history. The norm is for governments to go bankrupt over any extended periods of time, including the countries which are on top. After the First World War, 100 years ago, the UK was the richest, most powerful country in the world. There was no number two. Well, I can remember when the UK went bankrupt in the, in the night two generations later, three generations later. Could not sell long-term debt. The IMF had to bail them out. You're not old enough to remember when the French were like that or the Spanish or the Dutch. You know, everybody has been on top. Well, not everybody, but many people have been on top one time or another. They've all gone bankrupt. Why, why do you think people cannot go bankrupt? Oh, I don't think they can't go bankrupt. I guess what I don't see is there's no IMF to bail out the U.S. The U.S. is big enough that there is no entity to bail it out. So the bailout doesn't happen. Something else happens. And if the something else is a U.S. sovereign bond crisis, I mean, holy cow, Jim, U.S. Treasury bonds are pretty much the safe haven asset and the reserve central bank reserve asset of the entire globe. So if you have a crisis in, in, you know, unserviceable U.S. debt where the U.S. government cannot pay its bills, and that means that U.S. treasuries no longer have that safe haven value, what happens at that point? (laughs) Well, Eric, uh, I suggest that you uh, do a little more research, although I don't think you need to because you're you know you're very knowledgeable, but if you do a lot of research and become knowledgeable about what's going on in the world, you're going to get very, very worried. And if you get very, very worried, you're going to, I hope, get prepared because we're going to have the worst economic problems we've had in your lifetime or my lifetime. And when that happens, a lot of people are going to disappear. You know, 19, I'm sorry, 2008. Bear Stearns disappeared. Bear Stearns had been around over 90 years. Lehman Brothers disappeared. Lehman Brothers had been around over 150 years. A long, long time, a long, glorious history. Been through wars, depression, civil war. They've been through everything, and yet they disappeared. So the next time around, it's going to be worse than anything we've seen, and a lot of institutions, people, companies, even countries, Certainly governments and maybe even countries are going to disappear. I hope you get very worried. I am very worried, Jim. And, you know, it leads into my next question because you are such an astute student of history and you understand longer term trends. And I I look at, you know, of course, Donald Trump has been elected president of the United States. The UK has voted to exit the European Union. There are movements underway which could lead to referenda in several other European countries that could lead to more countries abandoning the EU. So as a history student, Jim, what is this global rise in populism and rejection of government authority around the world telling us? It almost feels like, you know, the we're headed uh, down the road to revolution and, and things are about to come unglued. Am I am I exaggerating to think it's that bad? Well, let's just talk about some of the things going to happen in the next couple of years, and then I think we can draw further conclusions. There are going to be more movements in Europe, for instance, to for countries to split up and for countries to leave the EU. You mentioned the France before. Uh, there are people in France who want to split the country, there are people in Italy, Spain, Belgium who want to split those countries, they are now going to be encouraged by the fact that Brexit was successful. The Scots are going to have another election about the possibility of leaving the UK. Whether these things happen or not, uh, Eric, I I don't know yet. I, I have views, but who cares? But we're certainly going to have the ongoing turmoil that these movements are alive and well and will be very active and vocal and visible. 
for a while. Now let's assume that some, or let's presume for a moment that some of them are successful. Well, if if the European Union starts breaking up or the euro starts breaking up, that's going to throw a spanner in a lot of people's works because nobody's really sort of planned on that. Most of the bonds, the euro bonds, none of them, very few of them now, have any provision for what happens if there is no euro. I mean, Italy owns several billion dollars worth of bonds. Suppose Italy pulls out of the euro and they suddenly say, okay, we're going to pay you back in lira. Well, that's, that's going to confuse a lot of people and cause a lot more turmoil. You have the same sorts of movements in Asia, not nearly as powerful or as vocal yet, but you have the same sorts of in – the, in the United States, there's a movement now for California to withdraw from the U.S., and by the way, in the U.S., there are a lot of people who would like to see California leave the U.S. So it may work. It may work both ways. So when you start having bear markets, as you, I'm sure, well know, if one bad thing happens, then another bad thing happens, and these things snowball, just like in bull markets. Good news comes out, then more good news comes out. And the next thing you know, you're five or six or seven years into a bull market. Well, bear markets do the same thing. And so we have a lot of bad news on the horizon. I haven't even gotten to war. I haven't even gotten to trade war or anything like that. But, you know, things do go wrong. Well, that was my next question is we spoke a year ago, ago about a topic that most people don't feel comfortable talking about. But I think you and I recognize that it's probably the most important question there is, which is history teaches us that when economic conditions are like they are now, usually it leads to war, either a trade war or a shooting war. And you were outspoken last year in saying that when you have an economic superpower of yesteryear that starts to become stagnant or even begins to decline, and you suggested that the U.S. had certainly started to become stagnant, if not in actual decline, that that has all, well, almost always led to war. So you went on to observe that it's easy to stir people up by blaming foreigners for all of our woes. Now, those probably sounded like crazy words to a lot of people last year, but look at where we are now a year later. We have an immigration ban against seven countries that seems to be heating up as one of the most contentious and heated both legal and political battles in U.S. history. So where do we stand in this big picture, Jim? Are we actually headed towards war? Does it start as a trade war or does it actually begin as a shooting war? What issues and events are on your radar screen in terms of important signposts that will tell us where this whole situation is headed? Well, as we discussed before... Whenever things are soft or bad and things are going wrong, people look for somebody to blame. They always, throughout history, wherever we are, whichever country we're discussing, the first people blamed are always the foreigners. They have different color skin, different languages, different religions, different food. They smell bad. Their food smells bad. I cannot tell you how many times I've heard people talk about how, oh, those people, their food smells bad, and they smell bad too. So it's very easy. It's always happened that way to blame the foreigners for better or for worse. It seems it is happening, as you point out, in the U.S. again, but it's also happening in other places, Germany, France, Italy, many places. They're blaming the foreigners already again. Uh, it's even happening in Singapore to some extent where I live, nothing like, nothing like in Europe at the moment. And as you rile up against the foreigners, most countries historically have closed off one way or the other. They close their borders. They close their economies. And when you close the economy, it leads to economic problems. And sometimes eventually, if you get into real serious trade wars, it leads to bankruptcy and even, and even worse. You know, uh, it's rare. I don't think ever in history – that one country has started a trade war and the other country says, oh, well, that's too bad. Well, we're not going to do anything. We're just going to sit here and let you hit us again and again and again. No, the other countries retaliate. That's the way human beings are. So if country X starts a trade war, then country Y hits back. And then country X hits back and country Y hits back. And the next thing you know, country C and D and E 
are involved as well. And everybody's suffering. And then as economies get worse, more and more things happen, more and more discrimination, more and more blame, and then eventually bullets start flying. So no, I, I don't like at all what I see happening. It's There are many analogies that to previous periods in history. Before the First World War, this sort of thing started happening. And certainly before the Second World War, this sort of thing started happening. Uh, it's been it's been common throughout history, and these wars, you know, when they start, they usually in, in 1914 nobody nobody could conceive of war, and then the next thing you knew, it was war, and everybody said, "Don't worry, it'll be over by Christmas." Well, six months later, everybody was saying, "How do we get into this war? How do we get out of this war? It's absurd. It's ludicrous, etc." And that's been the case for many. Many, most wars, if you go back and look, some bureaucrat throws his weight around. The next thing you know, another bureaucrat throws his weight around. And the next thing you know, 20-year-old kids are shooting at each other instead of drinking beer together. And everybody's suffering. So, no, that, am I worried? I'm very worried. And, and I know enough history to know that these things have often, often led to real war. Certainly, you know, we just had a president who won the Nobel Peace Prize, of all things. Well, he started more wars probably than most presidents in American history. Uh, America seems to have a, a penchant for war, and they seem to like to get involved. Well, that certainly is true. On a related note to that, let's talk for a minute about U.S.-Russian relationships. The Democrats would have us believe that Donald Trump did not win the election, but actually evil Russian agents hacked the election and undermined American democracy, effectively throwing the election to Donald Trump. Nancy Pelosi even demanded just this past week that the FBI should launch a major investigation to figure out what information the Russians are holding on Donald Trump in order to blackmail him into bowing to their wishes. President Trump, on the other hand, continues to reiterate that he has no ties to Russia, no business deals in Russia, no personal relationships with the Russian government, never talked to Putin, doesn't know Putin, and so on and so forth. And he's been particularly outspoken in saying that getting along with Russia is a good thing, not a bad thing, that America should strive to get along with Russia, that he hopes to get along with Putin, even though he says that he doesn't know him. And President Trump has suggested that it is the Democrats who are trying to start World War III with all of their anti-Russian rhetoric and accusations. Now, you're the history and world affairs guru, Jim. Are the Russians really the bad guys here, or are they being scapegoated in order to facilitate an American political rhetoric campaign against the president? Well, I do know that uh, during the last administration, uh, Mr. Obama's administration, as you probably remember uh, we started we tried to pull off an illegal coup in the uh, in Ukraine you know we we got caught at it uh, what's her name uh, Victoria Lundgren whatever the woman's name in the State Department they, they there are several uh, pieces of evidence where we know she tried to instigate an illegal coup then of course the Russians outsmarted us and so the State Department started blaming it on the Russians and the Hype against the Russians has gotten bigger and bigger ever since after we started the – or tried to start, tried to instigate the illegal coup in, in Crimea and Ukraine. So, yes, we, we, we are certainly at, at fault to some extent, and obviously you then – when you're caught, you got to keep the rhetoric up and keep throwing more and more accusations, and so the State Department has done that. Uh, I know that before that illegal coup – uh, Obama, Bush, everybody was trying to be friends with the Russians, rightly so. The Cold War had ended long ago. The Russians wanted to be friends with America. Uh, we didn't need NATO anymore. Who needed the Cold War, et cetera? All the money we were spending on some of these uh, arms manufacturers and, and soldiers. So until the illegal two took place, we were all trying to be great friends. You remember George Bush said, I looked him in the eye and he's a man I can ad admire and, and work with, et cetera. So it, now, of course, the Democrats, especially since they lost the election, are trying to blame it on, on the Russians. It's unfathomable to me how the Russians could have 
determine the outcome of the election. Maybe, maybe they planted a story or two, but so what? It's inconceivable to me that the Russians could influence, much less determine the election. I think if we start finding, having investigations of illegal voting, I'm afraid we're going to find more for the Democrats and for the Republicans, places, big cities in America, I won't name names, but so far the few investigations that have taken place, we find that the voting irregularity, voting irregularities are in big cities which are democratic strongholds. Let's move on to precious metals next. Last year you said that you owned gold and you weren't selling it, but you were also quick to say that you weren't buying any more either. You, you thought that better buying opportunities might still lie ahead and you were holding off until they materialized. What's the update on your outlook for precious metals in the months and years ahead? Well, the same way, I still own it. Uh, I'm not buying any more. Uh, you know, the gold more or less went up, went down. I suspect gold is today is where it was back then, maybe a little higher, maybe a little lower. Uh, I'm still sitting and watching. I want to own more gold. I want to own more silver, but I want to own it at a lower price, which I expect. Now, Eric, I repeat, I'm the single worst market timer in the world. So gold may not go down ever again. Uh, if it does, I hope I'm smart enough to buy more. If it doesn't, I own some. Well, I'll repeat what I said one year ago, which is I don't believe you're the world's worst market timer. I think you're actually a little bit better than that, as evidenced by your 4,200% in seven years track record when you were running your fund. But let's uh, move on from there. Well, it was, it was well, just a little bit. That was a long time ago. And second of all, it was 10 years. It was seven years. But it doesn't matter. I mean, it's not that important. It was a long time ago. Okay. Well, I, uh, I still will, will add a little bit more credence than you take credit for to your, uh, your abilities in the markets. Let's move on to another topic that you mentioned last time, which is you described the desire of governments to outlaw cash because that, of course, allows governments much more control over the financial system. They can impose negative interest rates, do all sorts of other things and control everyone's finance. Needless to say, those were very prescient words. So many government officials and academics have come out in the last year, particularly from Harvard University, Ken Rogoff, professor there, calling for an outright ban on cash in favor of purely electronic currency systems. The European Union has already floated proposed new regulations that would limit cash transactions. Jim, where's all of this headed and what's in store for markets as governments continue to wage war against cash? Governments are always looking out for themselves first, and it's the, it's the same old thing. You know, Eric, this has been going on for hundreds of years. Uh, the Indians recently did the same thing. They, uh, they withdrew 86% of the currency in circulation, and they have now made it illegal to spend more than, I think it's about 4,000 U.S. dollars in any cash transaction. Uh, in France, it's, you cannot use more than, I think it's 1,000 euros Many countries are already doing this. Some states in the U.S., you cannot do, make tra cash transactions above a certain amount. Governments love it. Then they can control you. If you want to go and buy a cup of coffee, they know how many you drink, where you buy them, et cetera, et cetera, if they can all put it into electronic formats. And they will. <laughs> you know, the world is all going electronic. My children will probably never go to a bank when they're adults or never, maybe never go to a post office, maybe even never to a doctor or rarely to a doctor when they're adults. So the Internet and the computer is changing everything that we know. Uh, money can certainly be easily converted to computers, not today because there's still some people who don't have computers and the system is not ready for it, but it can be done and when it's done, the governments are going to be very, very happy. They're going to say they're doing it for our own good, Eric. You know, this is not for them. This is for our good that they're doing this. But it's coming, and it's going to be a whole different world in which we live. Probably not as – we are not, not going to have as many freedoms as we have now, even though we already are losing our freedoms at a significant pace. 
Well, and, and I'm curious on your perspective on that, because what fascinates me, I, I agree with you completely, we are losing our freedoms at a very rapid pace. If I imagined human beings in a free society, in a society that celebrates freedom, losing those freedoms, I would envision a lot of people, you know, under tyranny, whining and complaining and groaning about how horrible it was that the tyrants, their overlords, were controlling them. But we seem to have people cheering in the streets for this, Jim. It seems like most people are duped into believing that this loss of freedom is a good thing. The government's fighting terrorism, and we're going to be safer as a result of forfeiting our freedoms. What does history teach us? Is this part of a cycle? Is there a reason that people are reacting this way? Because certainly in other times in history, people have been very, you know, willing to die in, in order to avoid losing their freedoms. But they're almost cheering the government on in taking freedoms away now. What's going on here? Well, history shows that people always would like a little more safety and are willing to, quote, give up some things for more safety and security. I'm not, Benjamin Franklin said, well, anybody who would give up freedom, some freedoms for security is going to wind up with neither security nor, nor freedom, and they deserve to lose both. And, of course, that's the way it is. I'm not the first to realize that people who are rising to become dictators start taking away freedoms First, in Germany, they took away the guns. They wouldn't let people have guns in Germany. In lots of places, they've done that, things like that. In America now, you and I probably remember when we were kids, you had to have a search warrant. Now they can just break your door down if, if, you, if they have a, what they consider a, enough good reasons. They don't even have to go to the court and get a search warrant anymore. So it's already happening. And if you said to somebody, did you know they could break your door down? They said, they're not going to break my door down. I'm not a terrorist or a drug dealer. Well, that's how it all starts. People say it's okay. But then the next thing you know, they're breaking your door down too. So it's already happening. I, do I like it? No, I don't like it. But I'm not the first. What was his name? Goebbels, the German who said, if you say something to people enough times, they believe it no matter how absurd it is. And you and I have certainly seen it in the news in America. You say something enough times, people believe it, and it becomes politically correct. And then you can't even say something that's not politically correct in America anymore. Jim, you have achieved some utterly amazing things in your life. When most people think about going for a ride on a motorbike, they're imagining a trip around town. You literally rode your motorcycle around the entire planet while being followed by a film crew. And of course, that story was chronicled in your first book, Investment Biker. When you decided to take your new wife for a drive in the countryside, you had a custom Mercedes built and you took a trip through 116 countries. That story, of course, forming the basis for your second book, Adventure Capitalist. Jim, if I'm correct, you're going to be turning 75 this October. That's three quarters of a century on this planet. Is there anything left that you haven't done that you still want to do? Is there any goal that you have? And what have been the most rewarding and interesting experiences in your life? Right now, Eric, I am having a wonderful adventure. I've got two little kids. I never wanted children when I was all my life. In fact, I, I railed and advised people not to have children. I explained that children were a horrible waste of time, money, energy. I was never going to be so foolish as to ruin my life by having children like all those saps who had children. Well, I was totally wrong, Eric. I had my first child when I was 60, my second when I was 65, and it is absolutely extraordinary, these two little girls. I hope that everybody listening to this who has not had children goes home today and starts working on having children, you know, take a day off if you have to. Well, you probably shouldn't take a day off these days. These are difficult times, but go home for lunch, have a lunch hour for these children. You cannot believe how much fun and what a great adventure it is. Now, I think in my case, it's probably better that I had children later. If I'd had them when I was 20 or 30 or 40 or something, it would have been a disaster for me, for the mother, for the children. But everybody has to figure it out and do it at their own time. But this is the most wonderful adventure 
that I've had so far. So you ask what I'm doing next. What I'm doing next is these two little girls right now. And when they get older, I want to take them to some more adventures. But they're too young right now. Well, I must say it has been exciting for me having heard your story, following your work, reading your books over the years. Uh, I remember hearing those first stories of your decision to have children and your desire that they grow up in an environment where they could learn to speak fluent Mandarin and so forth. Watching your daughter's YouTube channel and seeing her interview you in perfect fluent Mandarin, it's fascinating to watch the realization of your goals. And uh, I, I would note that her Chinese is a lot better than your Chinese is, Jim, uh, and mine as well. My, my Chinese is non-existent, but when I show videos or when I put them on the stage, in front of Chinese audiences, they always gasp. I mean, they just gasp out loud. because They're so shocked at how, how good my, the Mandarin that my little girls speak is. So that goal, you know, I, I moved to Asia to make sure my children spoke good Mandarin and know Asia. That part has worked. It will not make them uh, successful, Eric, just because you speak English and Mandarin will not make you successful. But if they're working in a Chinese restaurant, at least they're going to be the maitre d' instead of the dishwasher. So hopefully they will have some kind of future. That sounds really exciting. I can't wait to hear about uh, what adventures you take them on. But before we close, your latest book is called Street Smarts. Please tell our listeners what that book is about and what they can expect to learn from reading it. Well, my agent and my publisher came to me and said, why don't you do a a book on how you got from Alabama to you are in Asia with two girls, two little children speaking Mandarin. How did this all this happen? It must be something. must be a good story. You've written a few stories about things. Why don't you put it all together? And I said, nobody would care. Nobody would be interested. But to make a long story short, I did it. Many people tell me it's the best book that I've done so far. I certainly enjoy it. It pulls a lot of things together. I certainly am glad I did it so that my, my children will know, if nothing else, in the future. Uh, it's a... It's a, a memoir, if you will. I'm a little embarrassed to use that term about anything with me, but yes, it's a memoir. Well, I certainly enjoyed reading it, and I can't wait to read the next book about the adventures that you take your daughters on. So, Jim, thanks again for another fantastic interview. We really appreciate it. And Patrick Ceresna and I will be back as Macro Voices continues right here at macrovoices.com. Macro Voices is a listener-driven program. Please email requests for specific future interview guests to requests at macrovoices.com. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com, and we'll answer them on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. We also welcome your suggestions for how we can improve the program. Now, back to your hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna. What a great interview, Eric. You know, again, we have another great macro thinker that remains bullish that U.S. dollar. I could not agree more as well with the, uh, Jim and yourself about junk bonds. Funny that several weeks ago I published a long treasury short junk bond trade pairing for my BigPictureTrading.com members. Anyway, what's on your mind to discuss this week? Well, last week we got into the topic of options with a focus on credit spreads. We went into so much detail that we didn't have time to get to one of our listeners' requests, which is that we discuss straddles on indices, particularly the S&P 500. In the market wrap, I said this week that I could see a big move coming in the stock market, but I just don't know which direction. So, Patrick, let's start from the beginning. What is an options straddle, and why would a trader employ the straddle technique? Well, first off, Eric, I personally find little appeal in the traditional straddle and strangle options combination because it generally is a cop-out to the fact that you cannot build a general directional bias. For those unfamiliar with the strategy, it is an incredibly simple concept. It involves simultaneously buying a call option and a put option. For it to be a straddle, it involves buying the options at the same strike price at the same expiration. And the only difference a strangle is is that it has the same month expiration but has different strike prices. The appeal is usually very high to the beginner. Because the market is fraught with so much ambiguity, the idea you don't have to pick the direction that the stock or index must go seems to make the trade appear easier at the surface. The real considerations are always the details in the fine print. 
Patrick, I couldn't possibly agree more. You know, you hear so many people thinking, oh, this is great. I can bet on something where I'm going to win whichever direction the market goes in. And of course, nothing comes free in life. In order to get that deal, you're paying something for that optionality. I mean, face it, you're buying two options here, which represent opposite directional views. So in a lot of ways, a straddle sounds to me like, you know, let's go out and buy non-refundable airline tickets for the exact same dates in February, both to Miami and Vancouver, so that once we make our decision on whether we want to go for a ski holiday at Whistler or a beach holiday on South Beach, we're going to have tickets either way. Well, that strategy only works well if you have a rich daddy who's paying for the uh, the airline tickets. So share with our listeners some of the substantive considerations and drawbacks and, and and why would this strategy still make sense? Well, the key is to anchor yourself on the fact that options are priced based upon probabilities. So when you are buying a directional option, you're already paying a premium that fairly accurately reflects the probability of you making money. When you spend the money on both a call and a put, you are essentially paying double the premium knowing full well that one of the two options it will be a guaranteed loss. Therefore, you're betting on a true outlier move in either direction. More often than not, it's a losing proposition. And the times that you are profitable, you need that much bigger of a move to make a big percentage return because you outlaid double the cost to open it. To make it worse, you've doubled your theta and your vega risks, so you're burning time at an ever faster pace if the move doesn't start moving for you right away. Now, as you just described, when you buy these options, you're buying a big vega exposure. And I just want to make sure that for those listeners who may be unfamiliar with that term, what it basically means is that you are trading volatility. So in this case, you could use the VIX, which is a gauge of the index volatility. The volatility of the S&P 500 stock index is what is measured by the volatility index or VIX. The term vega is used to measure the sensitivity of option prices to changes in volatility. That really does have to be the driver of your trade. Let's look at an example. So in the example of using the S&P 500, we can open a straddle in anticipation that we're going to get a big market move. While we can use the S&P 500 e-mini futures options, in this example, we're going to focus on using the SPY, which is the Spider S&P 500 ETF, which is trading around the $230.88 level at the time when we did this example. At the moment, the April $231 call option is asking $3.95, and the April $231 put option is asking $4.60. That's an $8.55 cost outlay. To convert that into S&P 500 points, that's the cost equivalent of close to 90 S&P points. Without volatility expansion coming into play, you would need to get close to a 200-point move in the S&P 500 by April higher or lower, to get the 100% return on the risk capital. A considerable but not impossible move. And not only do you have to make a 200-point move to earn a 100% return, but you've got to earn a 90-point move, a 90-point move. That's a big move in the index just to break even and not lose money. Anything less than that, and you're going to lose some money. And how much money you lose is going to depend on how much less than 90 points it is. So how much would it impact the options if we saw the volatility index double in the next few weeks? Well, that's exactly why someone way considered opening this type of a trade. For comparative purposes, let's use the last major spike in the volatility index as our base case. In the weeks prior to the U.S. election, the VIX increased from an October 25th low of 13 to an intraday high on November 4th of around 23, or about 10-point rise in nine trading sessions. Let's assume that the same type of rise was to occur in the next nine days. Well, in that scenario, you could see as much as a 60 to 70% rise in the options without needing the price to change at all. So if you are playing the straddle or strangle here, you really want to have the conviction that volatility will pick up and pick up very quickly because you're getting theta killed on the time decay. So now personally, Eric, because I'm a market timer, I prefer to take a much more directional play on my bias. And so when I do do straddles or 
Oxford's triangles, I tend to ratio or calendar them to express that bias. Okay, but wait a minute. What you're essentially saying is, as far as you're concerned, the only good reason to buy a straddle or strangle is because it's effectively a way to play a bullish view on volatility. In other words, the VIX is going to increase dramatically. And what you're saying is that's the only good reason to do this trade. Well, if that's the case, wouldn't it be simpler and more efficient just to buy VIX futures if you trade futures or the VXX ETF if you don't? Well, that's an excellent point, but it brings up an entirely new conversation about the different ways to trade volatility itself. When dealing with the VIX futures, you have to deal with the term structure of the futures contracts and more importantly, the huge negative carry that's built into them. The worst is that for many beginners that turn to the volatility ETFs like the VXX, rarely understand that the ETFs have to consistently roll forward the negative carry, which is always bleeding them out of their net value. Okay, we, we, we should probably stop there because we've got to introduce the concept of volatility as an asset class to start with. You bring up quite correctly, there's carry issues, the contango issues, term structure issues. There's a lot to understand here. So let's do this. Let's table it for today and we will uh, make a decision right now that the topic for next week's discussion after the feature interview will be volatility trading. So we'll come back to the subject next week. Meanwhile, we've received several emails from listeners saying that they like this option strategy coverage. So we're going to keep that coming, but please keep those emails coming. My last question to Patrick about straddles and strangles was inspired directly by a listener email, and your feedback helps us to keep this part of the program interesting. For those of you who are really serious about this stuff, Patrick is in the business of teaching people to trade, and options trading is just one of his course offerings. You can go to bigpicturetrading.com to learn more about Patrick's online education programs. Thanks, Eric. I look forward to sharing many more insights with our listeners in the weeks to come. Anything else you want to add before we close things up? Well, I want to thank you, Patrick, not only for this options coverage, but what our listeners don't see behind the scenes is you have really been just knocking grand slams in terms of guest recruiting. So we've got some fantastic guests coming up in the next month. Stay tuned, folks, to Macro Voices, and particularly, we need your help. Retweet us when we announce the show. Tell your friends. Forward your research roundup email to your friends and colleagues. And we've got a new way for you to help us to promote the show. Can you can you imagine a world where every single financial website in the world has a Macro Voices player right on its homepage? A little button with a Macro Voices logo and all you do is click on it and it pops up a window that shows you this really cool Macro Voices player that allows you to navigate through any one of our episodes from this week's interview with Jim Rogers all the way back to the very first interview with Jim Rogers a year ago. Well, guess what? We have the technology, as they said at the beginning of the $6 million man. We, we can embed bed them. We can make it better than it was, but we need your help persuading all those webmasters to do it. So if you're interested in this, take a look on our homepage. Look in any one of the guest interviews, including this one, for a link that says More Embed Options. And on that page, you'll see a little button that says Macro Voices. Just click that button and it pops up this really cool player that lets you uh, play the show. That thing is super easy. Any webmaster who knows anything can, in five minutes, embed that Macro Voices player icon onto their web page. So we need your help persuading them that that's what they want to do. So uh, please help us with that. And most importantly, please register your free account at MacroVoices.com. The more registered users we have, the more able Patrick is to recruit these super high profile guests like Jim Rogers this week, as well as a number of really big names we have coming up in the next month. The benefit to you is you receive the Research Roundup emails, which is a compendium of all of the coolest links that we could find each week. And believe me, you're going to want it for the next few weeks, folks, because we have several guests coming up who are chart-heavy guys that are going to have significant handouts that go with their interviews, and you get the links to those in your Research Roundup email. Meanwhile, for this week, Patrick, what's in this week's Research Roundup? 
Well, this week, what uh, you can find in there, first of all, is the transcript for that interview you did with Jim. Now, uh, for those of you that are clicking on that link, please recognize that it takes 24 to 48 hours for us to update that. So if you immediately are clicking on it, you'll see that it'll just come up with a quick landing page, and uh, you just have to wait until we upload it once uh, it's fully transcribed. Now, in addition to that, we have a link to the Telegraph article by uh, Ambrose Evans Pritchard, uh, which uh, discusses Asia's top banks warn that Chinese capital flight is becoming dangerous. To stay in that China theme, we all have another Bloomberg article where they're discussing China's reserves edging below that $3 trillion level as the yuan pressure continues. As well, we have a Reuters article talking about union credit write-downs as a ringing the alarm bell for Italian banks. You'll find this and so much more in uh, this week's research roundup. So that does it for this week's episode. We appreciate all the feedback and support we get from our listeners and are always looking for suggestions on how we can make the program even better. For those of our listeners that write or blog about the markets, we'd love to share your content with our listeners. Send us an email at researchroundup at macrovoices.com or tag it with the MVRR hashtag on Twitter and we'll use it in our weekly distributions. If you have not already, follow our main Twitter account at Macro Voices for all the most recent updates and releases. You can also follow Eric directly on Twitter at Eric S. Townsend. On behalf of Eric Townsend and myself, thanks for listening, and we'll see you all next week. That concludes this edition of Macro Voices. Be sure to tune in each week to hear feature interviews with the brightest minds in finance and macroeconomics. Macro Voices is made possible by sponsorship from BigPictureTrading.com, the Internet's premier source of online education for traders. Please visit BigPictureTrading.com for more information. Please register your free account at macrovoices.com. Once registered, you'll receive our free weekly research roundup email containing links to supporting documents from our featured guests and the very best free financial content our volunteer research team could find on the Internet each week. You'll also gain access to our free listener discussion forums and research library. And the more registered users we have, the more we'll be able to recruit high-profile feature interview guests for future programs. So please register your free account today at MacroVoices.com if you haven't already. You can subscribe to Macro Voices on iTunes to have Macro Voices automatically delivered to your mobile device each week free of charge. You can email questions for the program to mailbag at macrovoices.com and we'll answer your questions on the air from time to time in our mailbag segment. Macro Voices is presented for informational and entertainment purposes only. The information presented on Macro Voices should not be construed as investment advice. Always consult a licensed investment professional before making investment decisions. The views and opinions expressed on Macro Voices are those of the participants and do not necessarily reflect those of the show's hosts or sponsors. Macro Voices, its producers, sponsors, and hosts, Eric Townsend and Patrick Ceresna, shall not be liable for losses resulting from investment decisions based on information or viewpoints.